I did. But sometimes constipation would slow me down. I tried a harsh chemical laxative. They can be irritating or work too suddenly. Well, I found something I could live with. Already bought a Hyundai Excel. Don't want to see you blow it. If I can't turn it. You're watching Fox. You're watching Fox. Instead of killing his girlfriend. Robert North presents a clear danger to the community. A proven danger. The state of Pennsylvania sentenced Robert North to life in prison. But hiding in a wooden cabinet, he escaped. In Tucson, the Reverend Al Waddell preached the word. And the word was gun. Police say he earned $100,000 a year making silencers and other illegal weapons parts that wound up being used in murder. Convicted of federal firearms charges, Al Waddell is at large tonight. Patrick Harabio was building a new life with a new career and a new girlfriend. But ex-wife Lisa Castellone, convicted of selling heroin, couldn't let go. Then, a mysterious assailant shot Aramio in his home. Was it a man, or was it Lisa Castellone? Stand by. Our nationwide manhunt is underway. Your call to 1-800-CRIME-88 could give police the clues they need to capture America's most wanted. Good evening, I'm John Walsh, and welcome to America's Most Wanted. Tonight, the search continues for one of our most elusive fugitives, Robert Thomas Noss, Jr. U.S. Marshals say Noss was once a member of a ruthless motorcycle gang, a murderer. Maybe you can make the difference tonight. Maybe you've seen Robert Noss. Robert Noss was vice president of one of the most notorious outlaw motorcycle gangs the Warlock. In the 1970s, over 150 Warlocks roamed the mid-Atlantic state. The Warlocks are probably the most vicious individuals that I've ever encountered in my 20 years as a state policeman. Noss grew up in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, a tough neighborhood on the edge of western Philadelphia. At 19, he was already a hardcore biker. The scars of those years are recorded in his tattoos. The most prominent, a large green parrot tattooed on his upper right arm. Robert North presents a clear danger to the community, a proven danger. He has killed and has committed other crimes. In fact, has been convicted of uh, robbery, rape, drug trafficking, as well as homicide. And this is the woman he killed, Elizabeth Ann Landy, a local beauty queen who fell in with the Warlocks after leaving high school. This photo was taken December 10, 1987. The next evening, she had a date with her longtime boyfriend, Bobby Noss. And we've reconstructed events of that night based on court testimony. We watch these stupid old movies every night. They spent the evening watching television and taking drugs at the home of a biker in Folcroft, Pennsylvania. Sometime that night, Liz Landy playfully kicked Robert Noss over the edge. until she lost consciousness. But 15 minutes later, she revived. <laughs> she ran to the bathroom, locking herself in. Noth ordered her to come out. Robert Noss made love to the woman he'd nearly killed minutes earlier, but they quarreled again. Said Liz Landy died 
as a result of hanging for several hours. The following morning, Noss coerced neighbor William Standen into helping dispose of Landy's nude body. According to Standen's testimony, he and Noss drove to a woods outside Atco, New Jersey. Somewhere in that forest, Noss dug a shallow grave and buried Elizabeth Ann Landy. Her body was never found. Noss was tried and convicted of the murder on December 9, 1977. He was sentenced to life in prison here at the State Correctional Institution at Greaterford, Pennsylvania. Noss spent much of the next four years working in the prison woodshop, where furniture was made and sold to the public. On November 17, 1983, Noss and fellow inmate Hans Vorhauer carried out an ingenious escape plan. At 8.30 in the morning, both men reported to their jobs in the wood shop. During a routine cell block check eight hours later, both Noss and Vorhauer were missing. And on the day of the escape, a male and female arrived at the institution in a rental truck, identified themselves as Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, to pick up a piece of furniture. The furniture was wheeled out from the greenhouse to the parking lot where it was loaded onto the truck and taken away from the institution. Inside that piece of furniture were hidden Mr. Noss and Mr. Vorhauer. U.S. Marshals in Philadelphia commissioned this bust of Robert Noss. Forensic sculptors say this is how Noss may look today. Noss probably has a receding hairline and shows aging around his eyes. He grows a beard quickly and may often be seen with a five o'clock shadow. He has a weak chin. You can see it in his profile. He may be wearing a mustache, but they're easy to shave. And this is how he'd look without it. Noss is a marked man. His large tattoo of a green parrot on his right arm is a dead giveaway. Three skulls are also tattooed on his right forearm. On his left arm, his tattoos include another skull, a dagger, and the phrase, born to lose. Marshals say Noss may be hiding under the protection of the warlocks in the Philadelphia area. He may also cross the border into Canada to purchase the chemical P2P used in making speed. If you've seen Robert Noss, don't try to apprehend him. Call us at 1-800-CRIME-88, toll free. In a moment, the case of an Arizona minister who preached eternal life and manufactured instruments of death. Stay with us. In September 1983, a California man and his wife went for a midnight jog. We're concealing their names at the request of prosecutors. But hiding in the park that night was a killer. The gunman in this reenactment was recently found guilty of first-degree murder and illegal possession of a silencer. A 45 automatic with an extended barrel like this one was used in the shooting. This removable barrel changes the markings on a bullet so that it cannot easily be traced to the gun that fired it. The killer had another illegal accessory with him that night, a brand of silencer designed to make a firearm quiet as well as deadly. Police say the gunman bought his special tools from the man who made them, a man of the cloth, the Reverend Al Waddell. On the edge of the Sonora Desert near Tucson, Arizona, Gordon Edward Allen Waddell was pastor of this independent Baptist church. The book of Revelation tells us that the mark of the beast is on the forehead. He preached a blend of fundamentalism and anti-government politics. Here's an excerpt from one of his sermons. The devil can get your mind. The devil can get your body. We live in a great day, folks. If you have a loud mouth and want to get something done, and if you and I don't get up and do something, we're not going to have the freedom to do anything in this country. But while the Reverend L. Waddell ministered to his congregation, he was also making lethal weapons. In a well-equipped shop inside his house, L. Waddell manufactured illegal firearm silencers. Investigations by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Tucson Police revealed that Waddell and his associates were earning over $100,000 a year from sales across the United States. 
It was a high quality silencer, primarily for 22 rim fire. He later on went into the 9mm and 45 and 380 silencer. On February 13, 1982, undercover detective Lawrence Novak attended a gun show near Tucson where the Reverend Waddell was selling silencer kits. Novak wore a hidden microphone, and this reconstruction is based on his recording. Hi, uh, what can I do to help you? I'm working up with Springerville Power. You know we got some labor troubles going up there. I want to talk to you about some equipment you're making that might help me with my situation. Sure, I can probably fix you up with something here. It's illegal to sell a silencer without government registration, but Waddell thought he'd found a loophole in the law. You'd need to check with my uh, partner over there. According to Detective Novak's report, Waddell sold the internal parts for silencers while an associate sold the rest of the kit. In this way, Waddell was able to sell his silencers to anyone. Police say many of his customers had criminal records and couldn't buy a silencer legally. Remove the suppressor in the barrel, the regular barrel back on, you got a legal weapon. That you can get stuck. And if you have to use the thing, all you do is... He's a very intelligent person. He's very articulate. He has an ego. He is intuitive. He is evasive. He's um, somewhat conceited. The Reverend Waddell's antagonism was well known to local police. On June 22, 1985, Sheriff's Deputy Raymond Ford spotted Waddell cruising through Tucson. Waddell was driving his Lincoln Continental with a homemade license plate on the back. This reconstruction is based on Deputy Ford's report. Waddell was belligerent and tried to record the incident. Let's step back Why have you stopped me? Step back to the car, please. You have no right to Go stop me in car. this way. Go back to your car, sir. What is your authority to do this? Waddell claimed a constitutional right to drive without an Arizona license plate or registration. I have a sign that explains my rights. You have a sign on your car, sir. You have to have a license plate. Arizona revised statute says nothing about a sign. Waddell said his license plate stood for sovereign American citizen, and he challenged Deputy Ford's knowledge of Arizona law. You apparently don't know the law. When Waddell refused to produce identification, Deputy Ford arrested him. I'm placing you on the arrest, sir. Al Waddell has used many aliases, including Al Miller, George Edward Nora, and General D.G. Santini. In the desert near Tucson, Waddell tested and refined his silencers. They reduced the sound of gunfire by more than half. Waddell demonstrating his silencers in the Arizona foothills. He also manufactured a line of disposable silencers using ordinary plastic bottles. In May 1985, federal authorities were finally able to indict Waddell for firearms violations. He was tried before U.S. District Judge Richard Bilby. I have a right under the Fourth Amendment to counsel of my own choice, and I don't want a courthouse pinch. Mr. Waddell. You are proceeding illegally here in violation of my rights. I will not stay here voluntarily. I am leaving, and I'm telling you so. Mr. Waddell, sit down. Judge Bilby, you're an imposter, and I'm telling you so. Mr. Waddell, sit down. Sit down. Bailiff, we'll see Mr. Waddell. On October 7, 1985, Al Waddell was found guilty of making and selling silencers. United States of America versus Al Waddell. We, the jury, find the defendant, Al Waddell, guilty as charged. When they come to get me, when they finally come to get me, I'm going to have a Bible in one hand, a 45 in the other, and a copy of the Constitution in my back pocket. That was the Reverend Al Waddell's last sermon. On the day he was to be sentenced, Tucson police raided Waddell's home. They were searching for evidence that he was laundering profits from the sales of his silencers through the church treasury. Waddell was
wasn't home, but he wasn't in court either. Police say the Reverend Waddell had disappeared, leaving behind more silencer kits. We found the outer tube assembly and all the parts to put them together. It was quite obvious he was still in operation, and it hadn't slowed him down, even though he'd already been convicted for it. The money for the illegal enterprise was being laundered through the church's bank account. Al Waddell impressed myself as a con man and a good one. While in hiding, Waddell wrote this letter to Judge Bilby. Being forced to take part in that unconscionable travesty in your court. I know you've not forgotten me, and I certainly have not forgotten you. For you are an unregenerate man. If you would be interested to know when I will be found and returned to you, check Jeremiah chapter 36. When he wills, and not before. Sincerely, Al Waddell. Tucson police and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms have been investigating the Reverend Al Waddell since 1981, when they saw ads for his silencers in gun magazines. Now, convicted, he is a fugitive. Al Waddell has no known tattoos or scars, but when last seen, his hair was gray. He often lives in a paramilitary style, driving jeeps and wearing camouflage in the company of former soldiers. But the Reverend Al Waddell can also switch to a big Lincoln sedan and expensive suit. He's a Baptist, a graduate of Bob Jones University. But remember, the Reverend Al Waddell is probably armed. He's known to carry a Mac-10 semi-automatic pistol with a silencer. Call us now if you know where he is. Our number is 1-800-CRIME-88. And you don't have to tell us your name. We only need to know where the Reverend Al Waddell can be found. Coming up, the bizarre tale of a broken marriage that police say ended in gunfire from an ex-wife wearing a mustache. Stay with us. Last week, we showed you the letter we received from fugitive Stephen DiLorenzo, an escapee from a Massachusetts prison. He offered to surrender and said he'd watch the next two episodes of America's Most Wanted for a reply to his demand. Stephen, as we mentioned last week, federal authorities believe the sincerity of your letter. FBI agents familiar with your case are here tonight on our hotline waiting to talk with you. Call us and work out a safe surrender. You know our number, 1-800-CRIME-88. And now to Sacramento and the story of a man who was nearly killed three years ago. He's undergone seven major operations as he battles for recovery, and his assailant is still at large. In October 1983, 20-year-old Lisa Castellone was serving a sentence in Fort Worth, Texas for selling heroin. Her husband, Patrick Jaramillo, had served time on the same charges and was waiting for Lisa to come home to Sacramento, California. Hello. But Castellone wasn't coming home. After four months in prison, Lisa Castellone decided to end their marriage. A divorce. I just want out. With his five-year relationship ended, Patrick Jaramillo began to build a new life for himself. It hurt, but there's nothing I could do but just give what you wanted and continue with my life. Uh, there's nothing else I could do. Jaramillo got a job in construction. He began dating an old friend, Pamela Gilbert. One of their pastimes was rafting on the American River. When Pamela Gilbert became pregnant, the two planned to marry. But when Lisa Castellone was released from prison, police say she wanted Jaramillo back. On July 3, 1985, Jaramillo and Gilbert were spending the evening at home, and Jaramillo recalls what happened. Just watching TV and uh, this man walking the door. Jaramillo was shot in the stomach with a 22 caliber pistol. He fled down the hall, but the bedroom door was jammed. Though he'd been shot twice, Jaramillo fought back and managed to disarm his assailant. I was face to face, eye to eye contact, and I realized it was Lisa. 
I don't know. She just looks so angry for some reason. And I don't understand why. Jaramillo was critically wounded. When police arrived, all he could tell them was that the assailant was his ex-wife. We had to find a way to show that it was actually a female that did the shooting dressed as a man. We needed something tangible to say she was responsible. The gun found at the scene was traced to a man in Mesa, Arizona, who said he sold it to a woman he identified as Lisa Castellone. On February 19, 1986, he was arrested in Anaheim, California, and charged with attempting to murder her former husband. On February 19, 1986, Lisa Castellone posted bail, then vanished before she could stand trial. Police say Castellone is a heroin addict. She's quiet and withdrawn and likes to stay indoors. She has very fair skin and has always worn her hair waist length. She has worked in restaurants and as a receptionist. Lisa Castellone has used the name Lisa Ruiz as an alias, among other Hispanic names. But she often goes by the name Liz. Have you seen her? Call our hotline now, 1-800-CRIME-88. A detective from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department is here tonight, ready to take your call. As always, the call is free and confidential. And we'll be back in a moment with a recap of tonight's cases. And now, look carefully at tonight's fugitive. Here is Robert Thomas Noss, Jr., former vice president of the Warlocks Motorcycle Gang, convicted killer, prison escapee. This is the Reverend Al Waddell, a Baptist preacher who built and sold illegal gun silencers. Waddell is described as a paramilitary gun fanatic. And here is Lisa Castellone. Police believe she disguised herself with a fake mustache and tried to murder her former husband. She's a known heroin user who goes by the name Liz. Three dangerous fugitives. If you've seen them, call us, 1-800-CRIME-88. Recently, we've received a lot of letters from the families of victims. As the father of a murdered child, I know the grief you're living with. We want to assure you that our reporters are researching each one of your letters thoroughly. If we can help, we'll let you know. I'm John Wall. Thanks for caring. We'll see you next week. Together, they've been nominated for a total of nine Emmys. Gary Shandling and Tracy Ullman back-to-back -back later tonight. And when the Bundy homestead is invaded by termites, Al has the perfect solution. Just move everyone into his shoe store. How will they ever survive the night? Married with children, next. Puget Sound Television. Introducing the Don't Go to the Park. New chocolate, smooth and creamy. Fruit and yogurt. New fresh flat, 25 calories. Don't run out, no sugar at all. No happy fruit, you're always in the mood. Potentially dangerous. It's probably illegal. He's been cloning a dead person without a license. It's definitely crazy. <laughs> Peter O'Toole. He's a lunatic. He's got a teenage girlfriend. Mariel Hemingway. Warning. For the first time on television. A movie that lets you in on the secret of life. Want to get married? <laughs> Prieto. 
Tuesday night edition on Channel 13.